We're going to be Romans chapter 1. Uh, we'll get to it eventually, but that's going to be kind of the text for our study this morning. But let's first have a word of prayer, and, um, and then I'll explain to you, for those of you who are new, like why, why the disclaimer the, of the content. It's going to be a, a little bit heavy today, but you'll understand as we get into it. Let's first have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we just want to settle our hearts before you. We are thankful for the cross. We are thankful for Jesus who died on the cross. We're thankful, Lord, that you love us so much that you would send your son to rescue us from our own sinful hearts and from this sinful world. And Lord, we pray now that you would help us to navigate this murky culture, that we would be good ambassadors of yours, but at the same time, we would never cave in or capitulate to the culture. And so, Lord, we need your help with all of this. We pray, God, that you would be with us. We pray, Lord, that you would go before us now, that you would put a guard over the door of my mouth, and, Lord, that you'd be glorified in our time. Help us, we pray, by your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things, and everybody said amen. amen. Well, in light of the recent cultural chaos and the corporate controversies, I felt that it was time to address some of these things head on through a biblical lens uh, with a teaching today that I've entitled A Biblical Response to the Transing of America. C.S. Lewis uh, once said, quote, when the whole world is running towards a cliff, he who is running the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind, end quote. And so the world might think that we're the crazy ones because we don't embrace the stuff of the culture, that we don't celebrate the stuff that is happening in our culture right now. In reality, we are running away from the cliff and we want to take as many people who are on verge of falling off the cliff with us away from the cliff because it's utter madness what is happening in our world today. Amen. I took nine years of Latin. The word trans is a preposition in Latin and it means over beyond or across. And we use the word trans often as a prefix in a lot of our English words. A transatlantic flight is a flight that goes across the ocean. It goes over the ocean. The country of Jordan was originally called Transjordan because it was located across the Jordan River from Israel. We use the word in a lot of ways in our English vocabulary, but today the word trans has become a very loaded word. And so I've intentionally adopted it, I've put it in single quotes because I want to take time through a biblical lens to look at the transing of America, how America has crossed over, how we have gone beyond what we once were to what we are now, and what we are now is a culture in chaos. We are a culture in chaos, rife with gender confusion and sexual perversion and this so-called woke agenda. And it all needs a biblical response. I want to begin by making it clear that this is not a sermon in any way of hatred or harm. We don't hate anyone, and we certainly don't want anyone to be harmed who might be different or who might believe differently from us as Christians despite the fact that our church is listed on a Facebook website where people have been taking shots, they have a list, and there are people on that Facebook list, it's being investigated now by the Attorney General and the Sheriff's Office, because people who have been writing things about those on the list, some of them have been wishing harm for people on that list. Our church is on that list, okay? But that's not us. We're, we're not like that, and no one should interpret anything I say as inciting hatred or harm toward anyone. Now, I hope I've made myself clear by saying that, but I will be honest with you, I've been in this pulpit long enough to know that I can say boo, and someone will email me or take to social media and accuse me of, that's microaggression, right? right? When you said boo, that's microaggression, that's microaggression. 
You, you, are, you're ga- you said boo, you're gaslighting us like ghosts. That's what you're doing, you're gaslighting us. <laughs> okay, I've been around the block enough to know that no matter what I say or how well I try to say it, somebody's gonna take an issue. So to all the keyboard cowards who are watching, okay? <laughs> This this is simply a biblical response to the madness of the culture with a heart to want to rescue those who have been swept up by the madness of the culture. That's what this is about today. And to illustrate that point, I want to begin by sharing a story close to home here at Cornerstone, okay? A few months ago, we had a young man come here to our congregation, I say young, 30-ish, wearing a spaghetti strap, silk dress, and heels, and makeup, identifying as a woman, sat right down here on the second row. And at first, I have to be honest with you, I wondered, what's the agenda? You're going to get up, you're going to shout in the middle of the service, or you're going to call your friends and come here and, and, and disrupt things. And so I was curious, but you know, not wanting to jump to conclusions, so just kind of waiting. He never did any of that. I want to thank those of you, and you know who you are, who intentionally would sit next to him and gently whisper truth to him and tell him about how Jesus loves him and that we're praying for him and want God's best for him. I was also told that there were some of you who would try to engage him in the parking lot coming or going to do the same thing to try to speak truth to him, to whisper that to him. He never was a distraction. He would come week after week. We ended up learning that he had been previously married. He shared custody of a child. And he would sometimes, when he had custody, he would sometimes bring the child with him and register his child in our children's ministry and put the child in Sunday school. And I, and I thought to myself, the child's going to hear the gospel, and he's going to hear the gospel. Amen. And there were times in the course of my teaching that I would even touch on, because I always try to use the Bible as it, as it uh, can be relevant to everyday aspect of life. And so there were times in the course of his being here that I would even talk about gender confusion, not because he was sitting on the second row and I was trying to target him, but because it was just in my notes, it was part of what I was going to say. And hopefully he would hear the truth and some of this would resonate with him and God would use it. And he would sit there and he would listen. And there were times that he would applaud even things that I was saying, literally applaud. And he was a little bit of a distraction to some of you. I got some emails, not nasty emails, but just people saying, are you aware that there's a guy in a silk spaghetti dress who's registering his kids in children's ministry and what's he doing back there? And yes, we know, we've seen him, we understand. And he became the topic of a lengthy discussion in our pastor's meeting. And I said to our pastors, look, we're gonna have to just give it some time. We're gonna have to give it some time. He can't serve anywhere. But he needs to come, he needs to listen, we're going to pray for him, and we're going to hope that God gets a hold of his heart and that he understands the love of Jesus and the transforming work of Jesus. So we're going to just monitor this, but we're going to give it some time. Listen, folks, people don't show up to church all cleaned up. They show up to church messed up. They show up to church lost. It's true. They show up to church lost like sheep without a shepherd, and our desire is to introduce them to the chief shepherd, Jesus, so people can know Him and understand Him. And if we were to just simply say, you have to leave, then where would He hear the life-changing relationship you can have in Jesus? So we needed to monitor it, and we were. But I said to my pastors, "This, this requires a conversation. And one of our pastors, I think it was Mike Frick, because he's good at this. And so what we decided was we needed to have this kind of conversation with him. And so on one of the Sundays he attended here, Pastor Mike pulled him aside very quietly, discreetly, and basically said this to him, we're glad that you're here. And we want you to come into a relationship with Jesus. And we want your child to know Jesus. 
And um, so we're praying for you. Uh, we have one request. And the one request is that you honor for the protection of women and girls, our request that you never go into the women's restroom here at Cornerstone Chapel. Amen. That was our one request, okay? Yeah, we have to protect the women and girls. And, and, and that isn't making a judgment against him per se, it's just inappropriate. He's a biological male. And so we said to him, when we had this building built, we didn't do it to, to, you know, for any political correctness, but we have a few restrooms that are single stall family restrooms. And so we said to him, please use one of those. Initially he was miffed, but he calmed down. He, he heard Mike and he said he would oblige and he agreed. And he kept coming for a few weeks until one day he tried to enter the women's restroom. And we had been keeping an eye on him for that reason because we wanted to be sure for the safety of women and, and girls that we were going to protect the bathrooms. And so when he tried to enter one of the restrooms, one of our, one of our security guys, who's about 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, <laughs> close to 300 pounds, body blocked him and said, you, you are not holding up to the one thing we asked you to do. At which point he got mad and he left and he hasn't been back. I share this story with you. I lead with this story because I want you to understand that we must never lose the mission of the church because of our outrage over the madness in the world. You should feel a sense of outrage over the cultural chaos, but direct it towards Satan. He is the liar and the father of lies. He is the one who is deceiving people and robbing them of the truth. Your outrage should never blind you to the lost and hurting people around you, even if they don't presently see how lost and hurting they are. They will. In time, they will. And what then? Because you will not be able to help them find Jesus if you are so angry. But neither will you be able to help them find Jesus if you are so affirming. If you are affirming the delusion, if you are condoning the lies, you will never help them understand the truth and the freedom that is found in Jesus. We must hold the line on truth. And we must also recognize what, what Peter said in 1 Peter 3, 15 to 16. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. You see, offering the right cure requires first the right diagnosis. And here's the diagnosis of what's happening right now in our world. What is happening in corporate America, what is happening in girls' sports, what is happening on college campuses and in public schools as it relates to the gender confusion and sexual perversion and the woke agenda is complete and utter madness. It needs to be understood, that's what it is. It is madness. Look, when Target is selling women's bathing suits that are tuck friendly, okay, tuck friendly, do we really need this, ladies? No, you don't. That's madness. And for their Pride Month, Target has partnered with a clothing line called Aprilin, a London-based company which is headed by a transgender Satanist named Eric Carnell. The development of all this came from this guy who's a self-identified Satanist. Last year, Carnell wrote, this guy, he's a transgender. I honestly don't know what his biological sex is because I, I sometimes get confused. Did you, which way did you transgender? I don't even know. So I, I don't know, I'm not trying to be funny. I honestly don't know. But regardless, let me, let me tell you what he posted, what Carnell posted on, on his company's Instagram page last year. Quote, being called a demon is something I can cope with and the idea of a trans demon is pretty blank cool. Most of my work focuses on gothic or dark and satanic imagery juxtaposed with bright colors and LGBT plus positive messages. 
This is who Target partnered with. Now, Target apparently has since either moved his display to the back or severed. I'm not sure what the relationship is now, but now, now Carnell is mad at Target's response. But this is madness. When North Face has a guy with a mustache wearing a rainbow dress as their spokesman, inviting people to explore the outdoors where there will be, quote, hiking, community, art, lesbians and lesbians making art, end quote, that's madness. When Disney has a guy with a mustache wearing a dress and welcoming little girls into the enchanted chamber, that's madness. When Coles targets children and infants to promote the LGBTQ agenda with these outfits, that's madness. When approved reading material in the school system is so pornographic that when parents read excerpts of the approved reading material at public school board meetings and the school board people tell those parents to stop reading it because it's inappropriate, but yet somehow it's appropriate for the children to read, that's what? That's madness. When biological boys and men are allowed to compete in girls and women's sports and rob them of victories and use their bathrooms, that's madness. Whatever happened to Title IX? What happened to the feminists who were always championing the cause of women, but now they're silent? And then you have NCAA swimmer Riley Gaines speaking out against it, and she's canceled and assaulted when she went to speak at San Francisco, San Francisco State University, and she has to have bodyguards to rescue her from the woke mob. That's madness. By the way, we've been in touch with Riley Gaines. She almost made it here today, but she will be coming. She will be coming here to Cornerstone. And let's bring it closer to home. When churches are flying the rainbow flag and affirming sexual sin, that is madness. There was a lady who attends our church who lives over in Vienna. She was driving here and took a picture of the billboard of a church in Vienna, texted it to Pam on our staff. It was Emmaus United Church of Christ, and their billboard reads this. This is what it's there right now as I speak. It says this, quote, Drag Story Hour, Sunday, June 4th, today, 12 noon, at that church. They ought to take the word church out of their name. It's not a church. When the LA Dodgers invite, uninvite, and then invite again to Dodger Stadium an anti Christian hate group called the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, whose motto is, quote, go forth and sin more, that's madness. This group that I'm talking about is a group of men who dress up as nuns. They got an award at Dodger Stadium. And in their performance, I didn't even put a picture of the worst part of the performance. Just this guy here who's, you know, simulating Jesus on a cross. There was another guy who did a pole dance around him doing homosexual acts, all suggestive stuff, while this guy portraying in an evil way Christ on the cross is hanging there. This is madness. Let me tell you a bright spot on the L.A. Dodgers bench, pitcher Blake Trinan. So I'm on a, a group text with a few what I call a, a faith and freedom loving guys in the country. It's just a small group text, guys like Jack Hibbs, Charlie Kirk, Rob McCoy, uh, Seth Gruber, Sean Foyt is on this. So Sean Foyt is the one leaving, leading these uh, worship uh, groups around the country. And so Sean texted us 
a letter that he got from, because he's friends with Blake Trinan and the pitcher on the Dodgers. And, and Blake said to Sean, can you please text this out to your friends? I'm trying to get this letter out. And so Sean texted this to us. And, um, and I'm going to only read the first and the last paragraph. But this is a bright spot in what's happening. This is what Blake writes. First paragraph, quote, I'm disappointed to see the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence being honored as heroes at Dodger Stadium. Many of their performances are blasphemous, and their work only displays hate and mockery of Catholics and the Christian faith. Last paragraph, he says, I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. I believe the Word of God is true. And in Galatians 6, 7, it says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. This group openly mocks Jesus Christ, the cornerstone of my faith. And I want to make it clear that I do not agree with nor support the decision of the Dodgers to, quote, honor the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15. Now, folks, frankly, none of this madness should surprise us. The Bible says that this is what happens when a society rejects, removes, or replaces God. I want to read to you out of Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 28, so we can understand what is happening in our culture is something that the Bible clearly predicted. It's what happens when you remove, replace, or reject God. Now, I'm going to, I normally read out of the New King James, but I'm going to read this passage out of the old 84 NIV because I think it captures the language best. Okay, so whatever translation you might be reading from, this is Romans 1. I'm going to read verses 18 to 28 in the old NIV, but this is what it says. Romans 1, 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, verse 24, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Verse 28, furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, listen, We've rejected God, we've removed Him, we've replaced Him. This is what God says. He gave them over, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. Amen. This is like reading a newspaper. What God says is if you reject me, if you replace me, if you remove me from a culture, from a society, I will leave you to your own vices and it will not be pretty. Because you will end up spiraling to a dark place based on your own flesh and carnal evil desires. And so God says, I will give you over to them. If that's what you want, I'm going to give you over to those things. And one of the things he says here is a depraved mind. It is important to understand three quick points that when a nation or a society rejects, removes, or replaces God, the first thing that happens is God gives them over to a depraved, or some translations say a debased, uh, King James says a reprobate mind. In other words, madness sets in. Again, it's Romans 1, 28. Since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, He gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. Number two, when a society rejects, removes, or replaces God, people become deceived and delusional. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 11, it says, The coming of the lawless one is in according with to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. 
because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Now notice with me, it speaks here about the lawless one, the coming of the lawless one. That is a reference to the Antichrist. I underline two words in the text, deception and delusion, because what Paul is writing here to the church at Thessalonica is that the culture will be conditioned to receive and welcome the Antichrist, whom they think will be Messiah, because along the way leading up to the advent of, of Antichrist, the culture has been rejecting, removing, and replacing God, and thus they're deceived and delusional, so no wonder they're going to be ripe for receiving the Antichrist that they think is the Messiah. Paul says, don't be deceived and don't be delusional. And that happens when you reject and remove God. And then the condition will be perfect for people to accept and receive the Antichrist. Because they're already deceived and they're already delusional. The Bible predicts this. Number three, when a nation or a society rejects, removes, or replaces God, it unleashes the demonic. Literally releases and unleashes the demonic. First Timothy 4.1 says, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, how many of you understand we're living in latter times right now? In latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. People will believe demonic things because demons will be inspiring these lies. Did you know, this is interesting, Again, this isn't to make fun of, this is simply to point out through a biblical lens. Do you know that in the Bible, examples of those who use plural pronouns, we, them, demons. There's a story in Mark chapter five where Jesus goes to the other side of the Sea of Galilee to the region of the Gadarenes because there is a man who is possessed by a demon and Jesus is going there to set him free, to heal him, to deliver him. The text tells us in Mark 5 that the man was possessed or the man had an singular unclean spirit. Not plural, singular. But how many of you understand even one demon is too many, right? So this guy's possessed by a demon. He has an unclean spirit. And in the process of Jesus delivering this guy from his demonic possession in Mark 5, 9, Jesus asked him singular pronoun, what is your name? And the demon speaks to this man. My name, singular pronoun, my name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. When a society rejects, removes, or replaces God, from these three passages I just read to you, there are four D words that have come out of it, and here are the words. We become depraved, deceived, delusional, and demonic. And the one who is inspiring all of these things is a D word himself, is the devil. It's Satan. Satan himself. This is all Satan's attempt to pervert what God has designed and blessed. Satan is going after God's design of biological sex. Satan is going after God's design of marriage between a man and a woman and exclusive sexual intimacy between them. And Satan is going after the most vulnerable and precious of all of God's creation, both inside the womb and outside the womb, the children. Yeah. He's going after your children. <laughs> and it isn't the first time and it won't be the last. Look at the example of Nazi Germany with Hitler's youth movement of the 1930s. Satan inspired a madman, Hitler, to go after the children. Millions of children were indoctrinated with rewritten history and distorted biology to perpetuate this myth, this lie of a superior race. And not just the kids were believing it, thousands of teachers joined the Nazi Teachers Association, otherwise known today as the NEA. But anyway, <laughs> it's true, you need to do your homework. Th 
thousands of teachers joined the Nazi Teachers Association and believed the propaganda and spread the propaganda. Educated, smart adults believed the lie and perpetuated the lie. How is that possible? Satan. Because he's a liar and the father of lies. To quote Adolf Hitler, he said this, quote, I want to raise a generation of young people devoid of a conscience, imperious, relentless, and cruel, end quote. Satan has done it before and he's doing it again. Now, you might wonder in all of the madness, after Bud Light lost billions of dollars with its campaign ad featuring Dylan Mulvaney, a biological male in a dress, you might be wondering why are other companies willing to follow suit and suffer financially for it? Example, headline this week, Target. Target losses swelled to $12.4 billion, shares at lowest since 2020. Like, why are they doing this? Why, why are they following this terrible lead of Bud Light? Okay, I'm going to submit to you two reasons, all right? Here's the first one. Because they are willing to suffer short-term financial losses for long-term cultural gains. There is an evil agenda. And corporate America is willing to suffer a little bit financially in order to advance this evil agenda. Like this isn't conspiracy stuff. You need, you need to understand this is the reality of what is happening. It is an intentional agenda. Now look, to illustrate this so that we understand from our perspective, using a completely opposite illustration with opposite values, Christians follow the same financial principles. We were following it before the world started doing what they're doing in a very different evil way. And what do I mean? Christians, if you're a Christ follower, you know that under the Lordship of Jesus, everything belongs to Jesus. Money is not king. Jesus is king. And so as Christians, what we realize is sometimes we will take a financial hit in order to advance or to comply with the greater Christian values that we hold dear to our heart because we want to honor and please God in everything. So example, sometimes you will take a lower paying job as a Christian because you want to spend more time with your family. And the higher paying job was more demanding, robbed you of time with your wife and your kids. And so sometimes we're willing to do things like take a lower paying job in order to spend more time with our families because money is not king. Godly principles is king, and, and Jesus is king. In the same way, for example, uh, some of you have made a decision that you're going to tighten your belt and live on one income so that mom can stay home with the young kids, and you're going to take a little bit of a financial hit because you want to do something that promotes and advances Christian values that honor Jesus, okay? So we've been doing this, and what's happened is corporate America has caught on, and they're like, okay, we're going to do that too only for very different reasons with very different values. They now have an evil agenda that they've decided they want to advance, and the bottom line dollar on the corporate spreadsheet is not as important as advancing this agenda. That's what is happening. That's what they're doing. They're willing to sacrifice a little bit of the money to advance the cultural gains of their evil agenda. And there is an agenda. I can't believe I'm going to quote him, but Bill Maher has actually woken up to this. Bill Maher, if you've ever, you know, he's a potty mouth and he's got a lot of liberal views. But on this, he's calling out what he calls the woke revolution. Bill Maher pointed out that the woke revolution is following the same pattern as China under Chairman Mao's cultural revolution of the 1960s. Mao ordered his citizens ordered them to throw off what he called the four olds, O-L-D-S. Throw off old thinking, old culture, old customs, and old habits. And those who resisted, they actually went around and put dunce caps on people's heads and so to shame them. And if that didn't work, they would kill you. If you resisted the cultural revolution and you didn't buy into this new revolution, this new humanity, they would kill you. You know, almost a million Chinese died under the Mao revolution. It was horrific. Because if you didn't comply, then the purifiers would come after you, known as the Red Guard. 
the Red Guard would come after you. And the only way you could survive, the only way you could survive was to plead insanity and to apologize and to join the mob. And then you had to submit to what they called re-education, Bill Maher said, or as we call it in America, freshman orientation. Because <laughs> our academies, our, our, our places of higher learning, they, they've all started to adopt all this madness. So there's a comparison here, even to the cultural revolution of Mao. And, and I'm telling you, you know, it is, a, it is a wild day when I am quoting Bill Maher. That's how bad it is. But let me tell you a second reason why it is likely that these companies are willing to suffer financial loss. Number two is because they are more interested in a high CEI score than customer satisfaction. Now, I'm going to walk to the back to illustrate this. What in the world does this mean? So uh, here's a little chart I put together because you can always follow the money and find out what's behind what. Okay, so let's follow the money. CEI stands for Corporate Equality Index. It's a rating system for how diverse and inclusive a company is and how well it supports the Alphabet Plus slash woke agenda. Okay, so there's a score that these companies want to get. Now, in the case of Target, for example, Target's largest stockholders are Vanguard, State Street, and BlackRock. These corporations support the CEI. Now, they're, they're bankrolling. They're behind financially, okay? So understand, BlackRock, BlackRock is the world's largest asset holder, okay? They're an investment management company. They hold the largest assets of any organization in the world. You know how much? $8.5 trillion. That's how much. So the CEO of Target wants to please the shareholders or else he's out of a job because he gets a low CEI score. And thus, you follow the money further. The CEI scoring system was set up by the human rights campaign. The HRC spent millions lobbying Congress. We're gonna try to get our agenda through the legislative branch because we want this perpetrated upon the American culture. So they're spending millions trying to advance all of this and follow it further, the human rights campaign is owned by the Open Society Foundation. The OSF is funded by George Soros. You can Google all this. It's out there. So let me just explain to you. This is why Target really doesn't care if you boycott them. Because you see, they've, they've got BlackRock. They've got George Soros. They've got deep pockets behind them. And they're willing to suffer a little financially in order to advance the agenda. Now. About boycotting, let me just say this because I get asked this a lot. I think that's up to your sanctified conscience. And you need to decide if, when. Here, here's, here's my, and I don't mean to be flimping about this, but the reality is how can you boycott the world? This is so deep and infiltrated just about every aspect of almost, not all, but a lot of companies. It's kind of hard if you, if you really do your homework about everything, you know, you, you might as well hunker down in the hills of, you know, Idaho somewhere with a shotgun and, you know, and grow your own. And some of you are doing that. And here, and here, and here's, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But here's my only thing to, to the preppers. The Christian preppers, I say this, you know, okay, fine, you know, be, be self-supporting and efficient and, you know, have the wells and grow your own corn and all this stuff. But the day somebody shows up at your front porch because they're hungry, you're going to shoot them off your front porch? I mean, what are you going to do? So you're going to have about a day's supply because if you really want to be like Jesus, you're going to share it. And so then you're going to die after a week. But anyway, <laughs> here's what I say. Look, people have to decide. You know, my personal thought is maybe at least pick one and divert your money somewhere else. Now, you might want to pick all. You might want to do everything you possibly can to not give a dime. And, and that is your prerogative and that is your personal conviction. And that's okay, too. You know, if that's what you want to do. But, but you better do your homework because you might, you know, you, you can't stay at certain hotels anymore. You know, you can't buy clothing some places anymore. You, you better do, it's not just these companies I've listed. This is deep. But the bottom line is, sorry to tell you, they don't really care. There's, there's trillions of dollars behind them. And they want to advance this agenda so badly. They don't really care if there's some short-term losses. So what can we do? 
Do we just throw up our hands and curse the rainbow? God forbid. But by the way, I got to tell you, you know, it bothers me sometimes, well, it bothers me all the time that uh, the rainbow has been stolen from God because it's God's rainbow. It's in the Bible. We, we need to take the rainbow back and use it for what it really is. It's a reminder to us that God made a covenant after the flood where he had the rainbow as a, as a visible demonstration that he promised to never again destroy the entire world by a worldwide flood. That's what the rainbow means. It symbolizes his grace that he's never going to destroy the world again with a flood. Having said that, he still has fire. <laughs> and he will use it. Because the Bible says that's the way the earth is going down. It's going to burn. And I'm going to read this because it leads into what can we do. Here's the, here's the passage, 2 Peter 3, 10 to 12. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. And since everything will be destroyed in this way, listen to the question. What kind of people ought you to be? What are we supposed to do? And he answers it. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Amen. So what should we do? There's going to be four quick things. The first one is we have to live a holy life. That's what I just read for us. There's going to be a day when God's going to judge the earth and the people of the earth. And when he's done, he's going to burn the earth up. And, there, and, and those who are with him will be with him forever. And those who are not are going to be sentenced and eventually in the lake of fire. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And so we should long to be with him. This earth is going to be destroyed. And Jesus says, in the meantime, through the pen of Peter, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Amen. Amen. In other words, we can't just be yelling at the darkness. We must be walking in the light Amen. as he is in the light. We cannot expect God to change the culture unless we are first asking God to change our own sinful hearts. When you look at the world around you, are you troubled by it? Of course. But are you more troubled by it than your own sinful heart? I hope not. Judgment begins with the house of God. And we must first take the log out of our own eye before we are able to help someone with a speck in theirs. We have to look at our own hearts. Number two, it's important that we have a healthy home. And by this I mean spiritually healthy. Praying together, screening what comes into the house over Netflix and Prime and the internet, bringing up your children in the ways of the Lord, talking to them at every opportunity you get about the Lord and the Bible and what the Bible says. This is Deuteronomy 6, 7. Listen to what it tells us. Impress them. Okay, talking about God's laws. The Word of God. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Like use every opportunity to talk to them about the Lord and about the Word. Spend time with them. Don't give me this garbage like, well, it's, it's you know, quality of time. It's not quantity of time. No. It's quantity as well as quality. We have to work hard at this because you want the hearts of your kids to be bonded to the Lord and to be bonded to you more than the world. And know what they are doing. Get into their business, okay? <laughs> know what they are doing. Do you know that the average daily screen time on devices for children ages 8 to 12, average daily, five hours a day. The average daily screen time for youth ages 13 to 17, eight hours a day. Parents, you are losing the influence over your kids to the device in their hands that is feeding their soul lies and misinformation. You had better control that. You had better be on top of that. You have to know what they are looking at. You have to know who they are talking to or you will lose them to this culture. You say, well, I don't, I don't want to be a helicopter parent. You know, that's what I hear. I don't, want to, I don't want to be a helicopter parent. I don't want to hover. You know, I just want, I don't want to be a helicopter, but I don't want to be one of those. Just give them kind of some freedom. I don't want to be a helicopter. You know what? You know what? You're right. It's, that's true. Don't be a helicopter parent. Be a, be a fighter jet parent. That's what you need to be. Be a fighter jet parent. 
be, be a Lockheed Martin F-22, and you, you lock in on whatever is attacking your child's mind and heart, and you fight for them. Fight for them. You, you ought to be on them like cheese on an omelet, ladies and gentlemen. Like Hunter Biden on a laptop. You need to be... That's right. Is that too soon? That might be too soon. All kidding aside, I've shared this statistic with you a few weeks ago. The National Center for Health Statistics reported that the age group, the demographic they are most concerned about because of rising suicide trends about among this one age group more than others, middle school girls. I'm going to tell you something that is just Gary talking right now. I'm going to take off my pastor hat. I know I have to be careful because the pulpit is a privilege and I don't want to abuse it, but I'm going to just share with you my personal opinion. I don't know that this should be a, a pastor thing, but I got to tell you something. When it comes to our kids, and I, I, haven't, I haven't talked to Terry about this, but I'm sure she would agree with me. If we had school-aged children today, all our kids are grown. We have grandkids now. We couldn't send them to public school. I just couldn't do it anymore. Now, you, you have to pray about that. That's your decision. And, and I don't want to disparage. We have some wonderful Loudoun County Public School teachers that are salt and light in the school system. And we praise God for you and we thank you. I mean that sincerely. But here's, what, here's why I'm saying it. Um, and I know it's difficult because, because what does that mean if you agree with that? It's like, well, some of you, you can't homeschool. Others of you can't afford, you know, private schooling. And so you're in, you're in a quandary. But, but here's why I say this. Let's just say percentage-wise. I, I have no, th this is completely hypothetical but because I, I don't know what the numbers would be. Let's just say that in the public school system, and I'm going to be generous. Let's just say it's 95% education and 5% indoctrination, okay? I don't want to expose my kids to the 5%. Like, like I don't want to take the risk that among other things they might be learning well, they're going to, that 5% is all it's going to take to steal their heart. And, and to fill their minds with lies. In the same way, listen, if you had a glass of water that you knew was 95% pure, but you were told there's 5% poison, <laughs> would you let your kids drink it? No. So, this is a decision that is difficult for some of you, and I get it. Um, this is in part why we started Cornerstone Christian Academy. We're going to do what we can to try to rescue kids, and we're going to try to do what we can to make it affordable. Our church is underwriting the school by millions of dollars because we're trying to keep tuition so low that it's affordable. And I just want to say this, and, I, and please forgive me if you think I'm, I'm, I'm trying to capitalize in, on, on the moment, because I'm really not. Uh, this is a plea to rescue children. There are some of you and, or watching online or here, you could stroke a check for millions, and we could scholarship kids all day long. And we need to, because there are people who can't afford it, and we've, we've dropped the tuition as low as we, and we are scholarshipping uh, plenty of kids. Um, but we could do even more, and we could try to expand our facility and do whatever it takes, because we want to also be a solution, and not just talk about the problem, but, but things are so precarious these days that you need to pray about where your kids should be educated, because whatever that percentage is, even if it's 5%, it's dangerous what is happening right now to steal the hearts and minds of kids. I gotta keep moving on because we gotta get out of here. But number three, we also have to have a strong stance. This is 2 Timothy 1.12. I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. In other words, don't cave to the culture, friends. Stay strong. Stop affirming the delusion. Stop, you know, I'm going to start, you know, giving people the pronouns that they want. Stop that. You are perpetuating the madness. You are affirming the lies. You can still just call them by their name. You don't have to use pronouns that are inconsistent with their biological sex. You're not helping. It is not loving to affirm a lie. So stop doing that.
But because of all this madness in the world, we need to saturate our hearts and minds with the Word of God so that we can counter the lies in our minds with the truth of God's Word. We need our identity to be rooted in Christ at a time especially when people are so confused about their identity. And, and what I decided to do to just kind of bring this third point to a close is to list six truths from God's Word, just six, what I felt like were six truths that counter the, the, most, the, the most current lies right now in our culture, okay? And so here they are. You can take a picture of it, or later this will be posted on our website. And I just encourage you, at least get these six truths into your heart so that you can be you know, fortified against the lies of the culture. So here they are. Number one, God's word is truth and the standard of all that is right and wrong. John 17, 17, Jesus said it. Number two, God designed us male and female, Genesis 1, 27. Number three, God designed each person with beauty and purpose, being fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalm 139, 14. Number four, God designed sex within the confines of marriage between a man and a woman, Genesis 1, 28. Number five, God designed all races with equal value and worth, Acts 10, 34 to 35. And number six, God loves all and died for all in order to save all who would call upon the name of the Lord, Romans 10, 9 to 13. That's the truth. We need to get that into our hearts. And I'll end point number four, I'll end our time kind of where we began. We need to have a tender heart. This is Jude 22 to 23. It says, be merciful to those who doubt and snatch others from the fire and save them. Jude writes there, there are people on their way to hell. He says, we need to snatch them from the fire. And we have to have a tender heart in order to do that. There are hurting and confused people in this world who need to know that Jesus saves, heals, and forgives, and that they can have a complete identity in him. Listen to this. A study published recently in the Journal of Sexual Medicine showed that trans kids were prescribed more antipsychotic drugs after beginning gender transition than before. They're hurting. Stats vary, but you can read anywhere from 8 to 13% of those who have transitioned are de-transitioning because they're not happy. May God break our hearts for them and for people in same-sex relationships and for people who have had abortions and for all who have been caught up in the madness and the lies. Spurgeon says, in order to be winners of souls, we must first be weepers for souls. And I close with the words of the Apostle Paul from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 14. Finally, be strong in the Lord. And in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to take your stand, to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Well, would you all stand? Let's do just that. Father, we're standing in your presence, and we pray in Jesus' name that you would help to fortify and strengthen our hearts to navigate a very murky culture. And Lord, that we would never be so angry that we would lose sight of the mission of the church, that we would still do all we can to shine your love to those who need you most. And we pray for them, Lord. We pray for those who are caught up in the transgender movement or pride movement or, or all of the things, Lord, that is happening in our culture right now. We ask you to rescue them. And if you choose to use us as vessels to help rescue them, Lord, then we want to be available to do that because we know that you love everyone as much as you love each of us, Lord, and so you died for all that you might save all according to all who would call upon the name of the Lord. Help us, Lord, protect our families, protect our marriages, Lord. 
protect our minds and our hearts from the lies and the deception of this world, that we might live according to the truth and hold out the truth to as many as who would believe and receive it. And we give you the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen, amen. and Amen. God bless you all. God bless you all.